Okay, hello everyone. Um, uh, so I don't have a more definite answer as to when the grades for the second paper will be, be ready, but I'm still, I'm hoping on Monday. I don't think it's going to be by the end of this week. Um, are there any questions about that? How do I turn off that ding dong thing? Okay, um, so there's base, there's four things I want to talk about today. Um, last time I said there were three times things and I got to all of them, but this time, oh, for the final prompt one, what do you mean about nature might not be the same as natural? Also, how many different philosophers do we have to include? All right, so um, yeah, I was going to talk about the final paper assignment next week, but I could lock Hobbes and Rousseau right. Um, uh, okay, so let me answer that easy question, which I don't have to look at the question for, uh, um, or the prompt for. Um, so, uh, Basically, I'm suggesting that this should be a comparison paper, and I think all the suggested topics are comparison topics um, or, are potential, or, or can be used as comparison topics. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, you have to discuss all, or I mean, it means that you should discuss two of the people we read. Um, uh, it's not such a long paper if you know if you want to mention more than two uh, you can but it's not like there's extra credit for mentioning more or something like that it's only if it helps what with what you're saying um, and uh, Locke Hobbes Rousseau or Wollstonecraft we're about to spend two weeks on Wollstonecraft uh, Obviously, it's going to be harder to work her into the paper because she's at the end, but uh, um, you can read ahead <laughs> if, if you need to start working early. Um, and uh, oh, and so there's a specific question about the first prompt. Oh my, I, I closed my browser to spare C CPU cycles. I closed Acrobat too. Um, Restarting Acrobat. Um, the first prompt is Oh, I just noticed it says Hume here by mistake. We didn't read Hume this year. I just noticed that. Uh, it says our authors are Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Wollstonecraft, and Hume, but that was last time I taught this course, I included a little bit of Hume, but not this time. All right. So the first, what role does nature play in the thought of our authors? Keep in mind that the words nature and natural may not mean exactly the same thing in different authors. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's kind of ambiguous. I didn't mean that a difference between the words nature and natural. I meant that the words, the word nature 
might not mean the same thing in all the different authors and same for the word natural. Um, um, nevertheless, right, so, so I didn't mean a distinction between nature and natural. I wasn't trying to emphasize that there. Um, I mean, they can't exactly mean the same thing because one of them is a noun and the other is an adjective, but um, 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 yeah, I mean, sometimes they go together really clearly. Other times it's true, like in some senses of nature and some senses of natural, they might not go together. Um, um, but usually they do, and that, that, was, that wasn't what I meant. To say. All right. Okay. I should make a note of that somewhere so I can fix that prompt. But Okay, like I said, I, I hope to go over this assignment in more detail next week. So if there's no more questions about it for now, I will put that off. All right. Um, okay, so as I was saying, there's four things I want to talk about this time. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get to them all, but here we go. So the first one is actually the last one from last time continued. And the second one is the institution of the government. Which is interesting not just for what Rousseau says exactly about the institution of the government, but how it shows that the, well, I'll talk about it when I get to this, but um, the third one I want to talk about at least briefly is slavery. Um, um, because Rousseau says some interesting and ambiguous things about that in this reading. And then, um, um, and the last one, which is probably the most important, so it's too bad that it's the last. Maybe we'll see how we're looking for time when I get to this. I might switch it because I definitely don't want to not get to that. <laughs> All right. Um, so in any case, I'll start with, with this one, which is the continuation of what I was saying at the end last time. Um, so, um, right, so remember last time I was talking about the distinction that Rousseau makes between will and force, right, where, um, will is a, is the moral cause of actions. It's a free cause in some sense, or it could be a free cause. Um, whereas force is the physical cause of actions and it's a necessary cause. It's not free. Um, so um, at the beginning of book three, that, that this distinction between will and force is um, then identified with the distinction between the legislative and the executive, that is, between the sovereign and the prince. Or government. Um, um, which, uh, is, um, interesting for a number of reasons, I guess, but, um, 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 
Um, well, the, the first reason that, or the thing that I want to talk about right away that makes it interesting is what would make this analogy work? So if you think about the literal, I mean, I guess, I don't know if, as usual, I'm not sure if Rousseau thinks this is a metaphor or if it's just like literally this is will versus force. But in any case, if you think about the simple case of an individual, right, and like I want to walk towards this object or in order to walk to this object, I need my will and the force of my body to cooperate with each other. So, um, the will, I have to want to walk towards that object, and then my body has to be in proper operating order, so that will actually happen. Um, now, um, the thing about that is that, that in that case, in a case like that, will and force seem to have the same object. That is... Um, what I um, will to do and what my um, body, you know, applies its force to do are the same thing, walk towards that. Um, and um, if that were really the way Rousseau wants to analyze individual action, then this analogy wouldn't be very good because remember the distinction Rousseau wants to make between the sovereign and the government is um, that the sovereign um, operates on a different kind of thing than the government does. The sovereign operates on universal cases right, by making laws that apply to everyone, whereas the government operates on, you know, is directed towards individual particular cases. Um, um, so I think the... Um, so first of all, do people understand what the puzzle is here? I'm not sure if I made that clear or not. If if the sovereign really is the will of the commonwealth, whereas the executive or the, the government is the force or power of the commonwealth, um, then... Um, um, you might think it would be like an individual walking somewhere, right? So it's like an individual, and they might think that an individual walking somewhere is something like this, that, uh, I mean, this is the way he describes it, that, you know, um, I will something and I apply my force to do the same thing. But again, that can't work for what, Rousseau thinks the, the division of responsibilities between the sovereign and the government are because, um, you know, the sovereign can only want things like whoever drives above 65 miles an hour shall be, you know, pay a fine. Whereas the executive can only op work, um, be directed towards things like Abe should pay a fine. So they can't both be going at the same thing at the same time. They can't both have the same object. So I think the answer to this um, is that, strictly speaking, that the problem is with understanding how individual action works or should work, according to Rousseau. Um, so we go back to this thing. I read it before. It's on page 167, book one, chapter eight. Um, where's my... It's the last paragraph on page 167. Um, 
For to be driven by appetite alone is slavery, and obedience to the law one has prescribed for oneself is liberty. So apply that to the case of walking in a certain direction, let's say. So um, I think what Rousseau is saying is, um, of course, it's possible for my will to concentrate on that particular case, to think, I want to go in that direction now, and that's what my will consists of. And then in that case, it's true that what my will is doing and what my body is doing will be directed at exactly the same thing. I see there's something in that. Oh, I see Tamara asked, could you give us an example? I think I just did give an example. Of. I'm not sure what it, which was you wanted an example of. But I gave the example of the 65 miles an hour law, right? So, um, so I think what Rousseau is saying there is, yes, it's possible for my will and my force to both be directed at individual cases. But when that happens, that will mean that basically um, it's not my will that's in charge. It's my body that's in charge. Because what determines me to want to do things in individual cases are these appetites he's talking about. And um, those are basically cases where the physical force is acting on the will to determine it. I mean, I'm filling in various details here based on like what I know Descartes said before and what Kant is going to say later, but I think this is the right way of understanding what Rousseau means. So in other words, that kind of action where what I will is something particular, like I want to eat this cake right now, is not free action, according to Rousseau. In free action, the will would give a universal law, which then the force of my uh, myself regarded as a body would obey. Right? So that... Um, that's so in other words again this is the word i wrote up on the board at the very end last time autonomy where autonomy means self-legislation legislating for yourself because again the greek word namos means law and this right i mean you're familiar with that auto from like automobile or whatever right automobile Automobile is a mixture of uh, Greek and Latin, which maybe you're not really supposed to do, but anyway, it means it moves itself, right? So um, autonomy means legislating for yourself, and Rousseau is, uh, is understanding freedom, as you can see from that quote, as what, what liberty really consists of is not doing whatever you want, the way Hobbes um, defines it because doing whatever you want means that you're a slave to your wants <laughs> and it doesn't mean um, everyone else being restricted from interfering with you because the way Locke understands it because that's still not enough like okay everyone else is out of the way but I'm still a slave to my wants so how can you not be a slave to your own desires and the answer is if your will is giving a universal principle to which you then submit yourself whether you desire this particular case or not that's what true liberty consists in so um i mean rousseau is more interested in the analogy between that and the state um well, maybe I shouldn't even say that, actually, because, I mean, um, um, he's interested in the, you know, what makes us, what makes a commonwealth a free commonwealth. And it's the same thing, right? That the force is always subservient to a universal 
rule that the will of the Commonwealth has given. Um, but it's not just an analogy, because he also thinks that it's only in a free commonwealth that people, well, at least that in a free commonwealth, people are forced to be free. Um, that it, I know that sounds paradoxical, and Rousseau loves paradoxical stuff like that. <laughs> but at rate that to be a citizen of a free commonwealth, you have to be free. How does that work? Well, um, because basically you always have to distinction, distinguish between the general will, which you find out by your reason, and which is a universal law, and your particular private desires. And the, the, the contract you've made is to submit the, your, you know, your private desires to the general will. So the contract you've made, according to Will to Rousseau, is a contract to be free. So it's, in other words, it's not just that, as we said to begin with, this, the, it's a solution to the problem. How can we join our forces without giving up any of the liberty we had in the state of nature? But actually, um, we have more liberty in a free commonwealth in the legitimate commonwealth of the kind Rousseau is discussing here than we would have in the state of nature, or at least we're more certainly free or we're more firm in our freedom in that case. Um, so, I mean, that helps to understand why he actually thinks that in this one case, if we could do this, the civil state would be better than the state of nature. Um, especially that original pure state of nature, right? The original pure state of nature in this sense of liberty didn't have much liberty at all. I mean, I know I didn't need it, so to speak, right? But like when I went to pick acorns and eat them, you know, and sleep under the oak tree that I got them from, I wasn't uh, following any general principle. I was just doing what I wanted to at that instant. So Vanessa has a question. So submitting private desires when entering the Commonwealth is parallel with laying down one's rights when entering the Commonwealth? Um, it's, I mean, I think I was saying it is what you do when you lay down your rights when you enter the Commonwealth, according to Rousseau. Um, because, and this is why he says you don't actually lose any of your rights. You lay down your rights that you had, which included the right to do whatever you felt like, but that was a right to be a slave to your own inclinations or um, appetites, right? So uh, you're laying that down, you're laying down that right. But that right is actually, you know, like a, a right to not be free. And what you get back is the obligation to be free. <laughs> so um, now you have a right to do whatever you want as long as you do it freely. <laughs> Before you had a right to do whatever you want, but probably you would do it as a slave. Again, as a slave to yourself. That's the um, that's the thought here. Does that did that help with your question, Vanessa? I don't know if that was helpful or more confusing. Okay, so um, so in book four, chapter two, he says something that I think. Um, I don't know, it helps to make it clear how this is supposed to work or... Um, um, well, I, actually, I'm not sure exactly how to describe how it's related, but let me read it. And I, I think you'll see it's related somehow. Um, so, right, because he's talking about basically another way of saying what you've... Or, or saying, I guess, 
like, okay, this is how it's related. Let me not show it for a second. So, um, you know, you might think, well, is that the right you're laying down? Isn't the right you're laying down the right to do what you want, even though the majority disagree with you? So in the state of nature, it didn't matter what the majority in any territory or whatever said. That was irrelevant. The question is, what do you want? So now you're going to say, what I, you know, I'm going to have to do what other people want if they're in the majority and I'm the minority. So, um, so Rousseau says, um, wait, is this the right place? No, it's not the right place. Chapter, book four, chapter two is what I wanted. That was book three, chapter Now page number 227. Oh, here it is. Sorry. So Rousseau asks the question this way, why should I be required to do, you know, something I didn't vote for? Doesn't that mean I'm not free? And he says, that's the wrong way to put the question. When a law is proposed in the People's Assembly, what is asked of them is not to be precise whether they approve or reject the proposition, but whether or not it conforms to the general will that is theirs. Each man in giving his vote states his opinion on this matter, and the declaration of the general will is drawn from the counting of votes. Right. So what's supposed to be happening here when we vote as the sovereign? Like, what question am I being asked? I'm not being asked, do you like this law or not? I'm being asked, um, speaking as a part of the general will, do you say that this law is what the general will wants or not? And if I'm in the minority, that just means I was wrong. It wasn't what the general will wanted. That's what he's saying. Right, So it's not like I was outvoted and I wanted something, but now I'm going to have to do something else because other people wanted something else. It was that we were all trying to figure out what we want. And it turns out I was wrong about what we want. So I was wrong about what I wanted. And that's, that's what he goes on to say. When, therefore, the opinion contrary to mine prevails, this proves merely that I was in error and that what I took to be the general will was not so. If my private opinion had prevailed, I would have done something other than what I had wanted. In that case, I would not have been free. Right, so what he's saying is that, like, suppose that even though the majority said, no, we want this, that somehow I was able to go ahead and do what I wanted instead. So Rousseau was saying, in that case, I would have been following my appetites and not my, my, my will, or not um, my will as rational, as giving laws, as giving universal principles. So again, this is, how, this is why in submitting myself to the decision of the majority, I'm not submitting myself to an alien will. I'm forcing myself to listen to my own rational will. And thereby I'm making myself free. Okay, so Tamara, do you, you have your hand up. Did you have a question? Yes, I, I understand the, the concept, but I think I'm just still confused on like, I recognize the will part, like I, am giving up my will to the sovereign, but I'm so confused on the force part. Um. Okay, so the force part, so, so, so right now, I mean, um, I wasn't just saying a lot about the force part, but the, the um, um. Like, 
do they go hand in hand? Is it something where like, if I disobey the will or the sovereign, then the force is like put upon me? Um, well, so that, um, yeah, I think it's confusing because we, because we're, t I'm, I'm talking about both the Commonwealth as a whole and each individual. So for the Commonwealth as a whole, it's free, just as I'm claiming that Rousseau thinks about an individual, it's free if its will as rational, as giving universal laws, uh, rules over its force as particular. So, you know, so the force is, meaning the government, right, the executive, is um, if the if the Commonwealth is well constituted, will have to can only do things that are authorized by the laws. So, but then I think what we saw from that quote I just read is that Rousseau thinks that being a member of this of a Commonwealth like this will also create the right relationship between an individual's will and force, right? So on the individual level too, the force. Right, like whatever I actually do has to be directed at some individual case. Right, I'm going to walk to there now. I'm going to eat this cake now, or whatever. So, um, but um, the question is, uh, how will the will contribute to that? And Rousseau is saying that if the will contributes only universal principles to that. Now we're talking about the individual will. And yet the force as directed at particulars always submits to that requirement. Then the individual's actions are free. And what Rousseau is saying is that the Commonwealth having that right set up where the, where the will, that is the sovereign, gives universal rational principles and the force, that is the government, is only authorized to obey them, will also set up the right relationship in each individual between the will and the force. Did that, did that help? Um, kind of, I think, I think I might have to ask you about it. I don't want to take up too much time because I know you said you didn't. Okay. Well, yeah, things, so. I'm sorry, but if you're confused I'll ask about... in office hours. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll email you. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm also I mean, really bad, maybe but... it's the word force that's, that's confusing here. Like, when we talk about an individual, you know, remember the case where he says, like, for some, for, for a free action to happen, two types of causes have to, um, have to have to have to combine or cooperate right one is the moral cause that is the will and the other is the physical cause that is the force or power of the body so it's not force in the sense that's of forcing something it's just force in the sense of like physical um, we're talking about an individual it's just like what a body does right it's that like yeah, that makes a little more sense. It's okay. I okay. I think I'm just like overwhelmed. And it's been, okay, it's a tough it's, it's a tough thing because yeah. I'm I mean yeah, and I'm I'm trying to get across a kind of subtle point because I'm trying to connect. I'm I'm, I'm thinking about Kant's ethics and trying to connect what Rousseau says to what Kant took out of it. Um. um so. Thank you for uh, the explanation, but I, I think I'll, I'll probably send you an email to to Okay. So I don't take up more time. Okay, so in that case, uh, so Vanessa says, only if one's private will aligns with the general will is one truly free or has liberty. Right, I guess that's right. I mean, but again, that means that, that means that your, your, your private will is not your private appetite. Right, so you're free because your will is aligned with the general will. Your appetite is still private, right? I want this cake now, but your will says, uh-uh, that cake's illegal. It belongs to someone else. 
<laughs> right? I mean, that's a simple case of it, but that's like, so, so, so that Rousseau is, I mean, for Hobbes, that's a case of lack of liberty. I want it, but I'm afraid I'll get punished or whatever, so I won't take it. But for Rousseau, if the, if the state is set up right and I'm a citizen, this will be a case of liberty. Because I'll say to myself, I want it, but I'm not going to give in to my desires. I'm going to follow my true will, which is aligned with the general will. It's not out of threat of punishment. Um, um, the threat of punishment has to be there to like set up the situation, but but you know the this in a well constituted state there won't be very many punishments. Rousseau says, and not because the administration of justice is lax or whatever, but because the citizens will it's their law they'll want to follow it. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's kind of connected to what I want to talk about next. So let me go on to that. Um, because, so, I mean, this whole topic is kind of connected to what I want to talk about next, which is the institution of the government. So there's a whole chapter that's just about this. I think it's book three, chapter 17, maybe, or 16. But, um, but uh, but there's things he says about it in other, that are relevant in other places too. And so, I mean, um, um, right, so just, I mean, the problem about the institution of the government I mentioned before is that the institution of the government is a particular act, so it seems like it's an act of government. By institution of government, meaning not deciding on the form of government, but in deciding who's going to fill the office, right? So like as Rousseau said, the sovereign, that is the assembly of all the people, can make a law like this will be a hereditary monarchy. The prince will be a single person, and when they die, their heir will be the prince, and so forth. But um, um, but that doesn't do any good unless you just say who the first one is going to be, <laughs> right? All we know is there's going to be some king, but who is it? So someone has to say, you know, Abe is going to be the king. <laughs> but the sovereign can't say that because that's not a law. Right? It's not universal. It mentions a particular person. So that's the puzzle. But I think to understand um, Thoreau's, Thoreau, Rousseau's answer to it, uh, I want to take a step back and ask, like, um, um, who the government represents is also a question that, that Rousseau asks. Who does the government represent? So, um, so remember, he thinks that sovereignty cannot be represented, right? So he, he's against the idea of a representative legislature. Um, Um, and that the main reason he gives for that, he gives a number of different reasons, but the main reason he gives for it is that, as he puts it, um, will can't be represented. Now, what does it mean that will can't be represented? So, um, uh, I mean, it sounds wrong, right? Like, Will can be represented, so you know, like I want that cake. So then I make you my agent.
Get me that pitch. Right, so I make you my agent to get me that cake, and then you go and get the cake, and you're representing my will. What's wrong here? Will can be represented. So that's how Hobbes will look at it. But, um, so, um, but Rousseau says, this is what we were just talking about. Um, I mean, I don't think he says this isn't an act of the will at all, but he says it's not a free act of the will. I want that cake. The free acts of the will are principles, are laws. Right? And, so, and the same thing goes in a free commonwealth. The, the free acts of the sovereign are laws. So why, so instead, let's, you know, um, so here's an example of a, of a law, so to speak. I want cakes. Now, I mean, is this good enough to make it free? Um, I think, I'm not sure if Rousseau has a good reason to explain why not. Um, Kant has a, has a way of explaining why not, but it does not really come into so. But in any case, um, it's definitely a universal principle, right? I want cakes. So now, let's. why can't I say, I make you my agent to get me cakes, and then you will be representing my will. And the reason Rousseau says is that in order to represent... Um, a universal principle, you have to have the same principle in you that I have in me. It's not enough for you to just do what I want in particular cases. You have to have the same rule of wanting things that I do. Um, and he says, um, if that ever happens, it will just be by accident. <laughs> um, so um, if this is supposed to mean that you represent my will to get cakes, then it's just not true, usually. Right? I mean, it's not true that you want to get me all the same things that I want to get um, that you have the same universal principle guiding your actions. You want what you want, not what I want. And that's what he means by saying that the will can't be represented. But the force can be represented, right? So if, you know, um, if this, I, I make you my agent to get me cakes, means not I'm making you represent my will. I'm making, I'm saying that you're going to want what I want, but saying, I want you to represent my force. I want you to do actions in conformity with my principle, then yeah, you can do that. Well, someone said, but it's still personal because it is I. Uh, uh, Vanessa said that. Yeah, I mean, um, Right. So, I mean, that gets to the reason that, that um, Kant would give for saying that this isn't a free uh, will. I can't at the same time wish that it should become universal law. Everyone should get cakes. All rational beings should get cakes. I, you know, um, um, and why can't I? Because some might not deserve it. Or It's complicated. Why can't I just want everyone to get cakes? Yeah, you know, but um, some might not deserve it, or also some might not like cakes. And the, I mean, it's yeah. There's a lot of things going on here. I think Rousseau also, you know, but I, again, I don't think he has the apparatus to back this up. Like when he's thinking that I have more liberty when I submit myself to the general will. Yeah, he's thinking somehow that.
it's, you know, changing this I to the we is what's going to really make it a universal principle. But I'm not sure he can, he has a way of explaining why that is. Maybe he does, and I'm just not understanding him well enough. But, but the main point is that I think you can, I mean, the sovereign certainly wills things for this commonwealth and not for other commonwealths. Right, so the sovereign, according to Rousseau, does will things like I want cake. Um, well, or do that's a, that's a good question. It doesn't will citizens, subjects of other commonwealths, to obey its laws. Although it wills that they would obey its laws if they subject subjected themselves to it, I yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this yeah, this question is too hard. Let me just uh, dodge it and say the main thing I want to. I think you can see the distinction I'm making with this simple case without getting into something that's more like what Kant or perhaps Rousseau would have in mind. It's just that. If you're, for you to represent my will, you have to have the same universal principle that I have. But for you to represent my force, you just have to do what I would do in particular instances. And that can be arranged. <laughs> um, that's, um, whereas the other is very unlikely. Because um, it would mean you have to literally want the same things that I want. You would have to want them not because you're obeying me, but because our wills are in sync. That's, I guess, is the point I'm trying to get across. For you to represent my will, you would have to um, um, Like independent of the fact that I want this cake, you would have to want to get it me, get it for me, because that was the principle of your will that you gave yourself freely. Whereas for you to just follow me in particular cases, um, your principles only have to line up with mine in those particular cases, which can be again can be arranged. So. Um, So I think this is why Rousseau says, and this is in chapter 15 of book three on page um, 219. Um, so it's, the first full paragraph on page 219. Sovereignty. Sovereignty cannot be represented for the same reason that it cannot be alienated. It consists essentially in the general will, and the will does not allow of being represented. It is either itself or something else. There is nothing in between. Oh, wait. Um, oh, but what I really wanted to do is skip down to this, I guess. So this is the second to last paragraph on page 219. Since the law is merely the declaration of the general will, it is, pure, it is, yeah, okay, this is what I should have read to begin with. Since the law is merely the declaration of the general will, it is clear that the people cannot be represented in the legislative power. But it can and should be represented in the executive power, which is merely force applied to the law. Right, so again, what he's saying is that... Um, the legislation can't be entrusted to someone else because entrusting legislation to someone else means trusting them to make the same laws we would make. And that's impossible, or at least very unlikely. But entrusting force to someone else, 
does make sense because we just we make the law and then we just have to require them to follow it in particular cases. Um, I'm not sure when Vanessa asked, can you repeat what you said about representing my force? So again, like representing my force means that you don't have the same law determining what you do as that I do. But in particular cases, you, you do the particular action that I would have done myself, like walk over and get that cake. And if I can set that up, then I have you representing my force, even though you don't and couldn't represent my will. That's the way the government is supposed to be able to be representative. The executive power is supposed to be able to be representative, even though, according to Rousseau, the legislative power cannot be representative. Right? And that's why he says, talking about, you know, the English and the way they, they think they're free because they elect their legislators, but he says they're only free at the one instant when they vote. And then they immediately become slaves again because <laughs> they give up the power to legislate to someone else. Um, So, um, but the question then is, so um, let me erase all this stuff about cake. And so the sovereign, can't be represented. But whereas, what am I telling this? Maybe I should put it this way. So there's like, there's the original versus the representative. So for the sovereign, there's the original sovereign and there's no representative. On the other hand, the government is a representative. Well, these can be a representative. And that's why I started by saying, so who does the government represent? Now, sometimes Rousseau sounds like he's saying that the government represents the sovereign. But the sovereign can't be represented. <laughs> so strictly speaking, the government does not represent the sovereign. That is not qua sovereign. The government doesn't rep represent the sovereign in doing what a sovereign does, that is making laws. So um, If the sovereign represents someone, who do they represent? And I think, although Rousseau isn't super clear about this, that the answer is that the sovereign represents the real government. I mean, sorry, but the, I said that all wrong. Who does the government represent? And I think the answer is that the government, quote unquote, represents the real government. Who is the real government? The real government is all the people acting as magistrates rather than as sovereign. So the real government is a democratic government. That is, it's all the citizens acting as the government. But they give that up to a representative. Right? So in other words, the original state of affairs is that the sovereign makes laws, the people as sovereign make laws, and then they adjourn as the sovereign and they reassemble as the government, and then they enforce the laws. 
and it's like a trick. <laughs> um, but um, but it's uh, an important trick because they're two completely different things, and they should be thinking differently when they do them, basically. So that's the original situation. But then, except in a true democracy, um, which, remember, Rousseau doesn't think is a very good idea or even practical, like, um, except in a true democracy, they leave that original situation because the people as sovereign continues to be sovereign. They can't do anything about that. But the people as government says, um, we're appointing these other people to be the government. So I think what, I mean, the reason I'm building up all this background is that when you ask the question of how the, how the government is instituted, Rousseau's answer can sound kind of like a trick and, and kind of worrying, like he's really allowed an exception to his own principles. Because the answer to how the government is first instituted, according to Rousseau, is um, and this is in, yeah, so it is chapter 17, book three, chapter 17, page This takes place by a sudden conversion of sovereignty into democracy, so that without any noticeable change, and solely by a new relation of all to all, the citizens, having become magistrates, pass from general to particular acts, and from the law to its execution. Right, so his answer to the question, how is the government, remember what the question is, how can a government be instituted because the sovereign can make a law, we're going to be a monarchy, but the sovereign can't choose who's going to be the king. So Rousseau says, it happens this way. The sovereign is sitting as the sovereign and they pass a law, we're going to be a monarchy. And then, without any noticeable change, they take off their sovereign hat and they put on their hat as magistrates of a democracy. And as magistrates of a democracy, they vote on who's going to be the king. And someone says, thank you, Alvaro, for posting the quotes. And yes, thank you for continuing to do that. And I, I, I'm glad you can do it so quickly, too. <laughs> um, I was skeptical whether it would be a good idea, but actually it's a, it's a great idea. And I'm only, the only thing that bothers me is I guess people watching the recorded lecture can't see this. But, uh, oh, well. Anyway, thank you. Um, so... Uh, Right, so as magistrates of a democracy, but it's a temporary democracy, right? Because remember, the sovereign passed a law saying we're going to be a monarchy. But then, just for a little bit, they become a democracy. And as a democracy, they, as a democratic government, they appoint someone king, which they can do because now they're executing the law so they can talk about particulars. And then they put back on their sovereign hat and make some other laws. But meanwhile, now there's a king to execute them. So like I said, that could sound kind of like a trick. But I think that rather than being a trick, it actually reveals how Rousseau thinks that all governments other than democracies are legitimate in general. So it's, I mean, so first of all, how can this transition happen? Um, like, why, I mean, why a democracy? Why is it that we can suddenly become a democracy, but we can't suddenly become a monarchy? So the answer is that democracy is a unique form of government where it, there isn't another act that has to be carried out to pick the officers. 
right? So when you pass, when the sovereign passes a law saying we're going to be a monarchy, we're not finished because we have to say who the king is. If the sovereign passes a law saying we're going to be an aristocracy, we're not finished because we have to say who the senators or aristocrats or whatever are going to be. But if the, if the sovereign passes a law saying we're going to be a democracy, we know who the rulers are going to be, everyone. So we're done, right? So, so the way this works is that the sovereign, when they pass a law saying we're going to be a monarchy, maybe this is only implicit, but they could make it explicit. What they really mean is, or what they really should say if they want to be explicit is, we're going to be a democracy long enough to pick a king, and then we're going to be a monarchy. And now the problem is solved. Right? Because, we, again, we don't need an extra step. We don't need an, another government to set up the democratic government. Um, But I mean, so so far, you know, this explains like how this trick is supposed to work. But maybe it's still not clear how it's related to what I'm saying here. Namely, that it's really the democratic government is the real government, and what we think of as the government, and what Rousseau normally calls the government. What we think of the government. And what Rousseau normally calls the government is actually a representative of the government, is what I'm saying, according to Rousseau. Um, so, um, well, if you, I think if you look farther into the way he describes this institution at the beginning of chapter 18, you'll see that that is what he means. Um, so he's talking about whether there's a contract between the government. Wait, I'll start up here, I guess. So it's the first paragraph in chapter 18. It's on page 222. From these clarifications, it follows in confirmation of chapter 16 that the act that institutes the government is not a contract, but a law. That the trustees of the executive power are not the masters of the populace, but its officers, that it can establish and remove them when it pleases, that for them, that is, for the officers of the government, there is no question of contracting, but of obeying, and that in taking on the functions of the state, sorry, in taking on the functions the state imposes on them, they merely fulfill their duty as citizens, without in any way having the right to dispute over the conditions, right? So he's saying, you know, if you thought that somehow being appointed king meant entering into a contract with the people and saying, as long as you obey me, I agree to be your king, Rousseau is saying, no, this is what happens. The people say, you be king, and you have nothing to say in the matter. It's a law. You have to be king. <laughs> but of course, that's a little bit imprecise, right? It's not a law that I have to be king. Because again, a law is not aimed at particulars. It's a law that someone has to be king. But then the people as government turn around and execute that law on a specific individual. So they say, you know, as sovereign, we just passed this law saying someone has to be king. Now, acting as democratic government, we're saying, Abe, you have to be king. And I can't say, well, I'll do it on condition that you blah, 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 because the real government just gave me my orders. Um, so, um, and... You know, to see how far this actually goes, according to Rousseau, um, I just want to point out one other thing. 
which is what happens when the people assemble as sovereign. So, um, first of all, you know, Rousseau in our reading says that have to be, there have to be fixed times at which the people will, will meet as sovereign, um, in which no one has to convoke them. It's established that they're going to meet on that day and they just show up. Um, so there could be arrangements for, you know, the government to call extra sessions of the sovereign, right? We need new laws now come into session, but there can't be, but there have to be meetings that the government has nothing to do with calling up. Everyone knows that's the date and they come, right? So, but what happens in these assemblies? So, well, I mean, let me just read what he says happens in these assemblies. This is, um, again, book three, chapter 18, and it's on page 224. Well, actually, let me start at the beginning, at the end of page 223. So, very end of page 223. The opening of these assemblies, which have as their sole object the preservation of the social treaty, should always take place through two propositions that can never be suppressed and that are voted on separately. So not only is, um, does no one have a right to call off this meeting, this scheduled meeting, but no one has a right to start it in any other way but on a vote on these two questions. And the two questions are, the first, does it please the sovereign to preserve the present form of government? The second, does it please the people to leave its administration to those who are now in charge of it? Right, so the first one, we understand, does it please the sovereign to retain the current form of government? So, I mean, the current form of government is only legitimate because of the tacit agreement of the sovereign to continue with the same law that it made before. But actually, I mean, Rousseau already said that, but actually it turns out that it's not really that tacit, right? Because at all these regularly scheduled meetings, the sovereign actually votes on whether to keep the government the same as it was before, the form of government the same as it was before, right? So like if it's a monarchy, it's only sure to be a monarchy up to the next meeting of the sovereign. At that next meeting, we can be guaranteed that the question will be proposed, should we still be a monarchy? And everyone will have to vote on it. So, I mean, this is actually like a lot stronger than having regular elections the way we do, right? This is like having regular refounding of the state. It's like having a regular constitutional convention, basically, right? It's as if like, you know, every year in, uh, January or whatever, there was a constitutional convention. And the first question was, do we want to still have the same form of government we have now? Okay, but then that second question, and he deliberately changes it from does it please the sovereign to does it please the people? Because this is a question that can't be put to the sovereign. Again, the second question was, um, now I can read it from the thing that Alvaro put up in the quote, does it please the people to leave the administration to those who are now in charge of it? So this is a question about particulars that the sovereign can't answer, right? So the sovereign votes, yes, we're still going to be a monarchy. But the second question is not a question for the sovereign. Because the second question is, so should Abe still be king? Who's going to vote on that? Again, the people take off their sovereign hats and put on their democratic government. Every time the sovereign assembles, this happens again. And that's why I'm saying that, according to Rousseau, this, all, this isn't really temporary, in a sense. This always remains the true government. And what we call the government, like the king or whatever, is its representative. Um, now, I mean, it's, we're only required an up or down vote here. Right. I mean, it's not required that we actually, you know, allow other candidates to run or whatever. But um, but still, it's pretty strong. It always has to be asked. 
at the beginning of every meeting. Um, so, at the, which means that at any time, the people could just take all the power back and become a, a pure democracy if they want. Be a bad idea, but they could. Okay. So I think, you know, and if you ask, like, why didn't Rousseau explain this a little more clearly? I think maybe the answer is because, you know, he doesn't want to sound too anti-monarchy. <laughs> He's still hoping that his book can be, you know, uh, legally distributed in France, if not published there. Um, as a matter of fact, he had problems, uh, although I, I think it was Emile caused him bigger problems than the social contract. But, um, but I think that's why he's obfuscating this a little bit. But the, so the truth is that he really thinks in a very strong sense that every legitimate state is a pure democracy, both the legislative and the executive. It's only that as executive, it's okay to appoint um, representatives to take care of the day-to-day -day business. Okay, are there questions about that? This seems to be out of focus again. I don't know why that's happening. Is that focused enough that you can read it? No, it's really not. I'm gonna. Go back in. So what time is it? You know, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about religion first because I definitely want to get to that. It is interesting what he says about slavery. Uh, he's basically against slavery is the short answer, but there's an interesting uh, complication there um, due to the fact that almost everyone in the historical Sparta, for example, were slaves. <laughs> That's something he has to address. Um, but uh, let me, hopefully I will have time to talk about that. If not, maybe I'll say something about it because one of the think places where Wollstonecraft is going to engage most explicitly with Rousseau is on the question of, um, was Sparta so great or wasn't it? But okay, in any case, so I'm going to go on. Oh, I forgot to change one to two again, but anyway. So this is now four on the list I gave before, civil religion. Um, so Rousseau discusses at least three and maybe four different kinds of religion. Um, I guess this classification is not completely absent in Hobbes or Locke either, but they don't make as big a deal about it as Rousseau does. Um, again, maybe just because Rousseau is a little more daring about getting in trouble about this than he did get in trouble. <laughs> but um, so, um, so the first one is what he calls The religion of man, you know, it doesn't mean man versus woman here, I hope, it shouldn't. The religion of humanity. Which is, um, if you look at book four, chapter eight, page 246,
without temples, altars, or rites, and limited to the purely internal cult of the supreme God and to the eternal duties of morality. And that, he says, is true Christianity, the pure and simple religion of the gospel, the true theism and what can be called a natural divine law. So that sounds pretty good, <laughs> right? He's saying it's, it's the religion of reason, um, uh, right? It's the kind of religion that Locke thought we could all come to on our own without needing special revelation. Um, it's kind of the same as what Hobbes says true Christianity is. Um, but, um, um, oh, Vanessa says, I appreciate that inclusive term. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would love to always use an inclusive term, but I don't want to use an inclusive term where I where I'm not sure that the author wants to be inclusive, right? Like, if Rousseau does mean man and not woman, then it would be misleading to change it to an inclusive term. But in this case, I think he doesn't mean man and not woman. That would be very, that would be a strange thought here. Um, so, um, right, so, so Rousseau thinks that this is what Jesus intended to preach this pure, internal, rational religion, which consists only in um, um, an internal cult, right? Meaning, an, what is an internal cult? It means your worship is con of God consists in your inner acknowledgement of the divine law, which is the law of morality. This, so, I mean, this is what Kant also is going to call true Christianity or the religion of reason. Um, but the interesting wrinkle in Rousseau is that although this is the true religion in some sense, it ultimately would be bad for the state. Um, right, so he says on the next page, page 247, Um, we are told that a people of true Christians would form, no, this is not, oh, Stephen. We are told that a people of true Christians would form the most perfect society imaginable. I see but one major difficulty in this assumption, namely that a society of true Christians would no longer be a society of men. Where, again, I think, although in this case it's a little more ambiguous already, to tell you the truth, whether you can substitute would no longer be a society of human beings, or whether he means men, like uh, real men, <laughs> right? Um, so, but in any case, um, why is that? Um, like, wouldn't you think a religion that consists entirely in uh, like respecting the moral law would be the perfect religion to found a society? Everyone will be good. It will be. It will be great. So he says, actually. Um, That's not true at all. It is true that everyone would be good. Right, actually, so this is the, look at the top paragraph on page 248. Each man or human being would fulfill his, do Again, I can't do this with every word, but you know, um, but, um, Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read what he says. That's what I usually do. Uh, but then I'll bring up, I sometimes bring up 
the fact that the language is not inclusive. By the way, Wollstonecraft will not be an exception to that. She also uses man this way a lot. <laughs> um, okay, anyway, each man would fulfill his duty. The people would be subject to the laws. The leaders would be just and moderate. The magistrates would be upright and incorruptible. Soldiers would scorn death. There would be neither vanity nor luxury. Right, so all that is saying, yeah, it sounds like a Christian commonwealth would be great. But then he says, but there's a problem. Christianity is a completely spiritual religion, concerned exclusively with things heavenly. The homeland of the Christian is not of this world. Right, what are you supposed to be thinking about when you decide what to do? You're supposed to be thinking about divine reward and punishment in the afterlife. Okay, it's true. What God wants you to do now is obey the law and be incorruptible and whatever, but you're not, but that's why you're doing it. So this is how Rousseau says this translates to action. He does his duty, it is true, but he does it with a profound indifference towards the success or failure of his efforts. Right? So Rousseau, and he goes on to talk, imagine a, an army of Christians against an army of Spartans or something like that. And he says, the army of Christians, they're not afraid of death. They're, you know, they're dedicated to obeying orders and, you know, fulfilling all their duties. But they don't think it matters if they win or lose. That's not what matters. Right? What matters is whether they do their duty. You know, if they lose through doing their duty, that's just as good as winning through doing their duty. We're really concerned about the afterlife anyway. So, um, um, so Rousseau is saying, this doesn't make good soldiers, right? What you want from your soldiers is people who think it would be the worst thing in the world if we lose. Um, and, you know, soldiers is just an example. He, I, he thinks this carries across to all the things that the citizens have to do to keep a state going, right? The, 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 this commonwealth of pure Christians will do it out of duty, but they won't care if it succeeds or if the state falls apart. And in the end, that lack of... Um, um, appetite to do these things. You, doing them only out of duty is going to make all the difference. Um, it's going to lead to the state uh, falling to foreign enemies who, who care about whether they win or not, for one thing. Um, now he also says it's even worse for other reasons because if you, he's been assuming that everyone in the entire commonwealth is, is one of these true Christians. But he says, if now let's change the assumption and assume everyone except one ambitious guy <laughs> are true Christians. So that one ambitious person like Cromwell in England is, is going to have an easy time making themselves into an absolute uh, ruler because um, everyone else is busy doing their duty and judging other people charitably and so on and so forth. And this one person just takes advantage of them all to take over. So in real life, Rousseau says, a free state of pure Christians wouldn't remain free. It would become an a absolute dictatorship, as, which is what happened after the English Civil War. Um, Okay, so, but anyway, that's, so that's one kind of religion. Rousseau thinks that basically it's the true religion, but it's not a good civil religion because it's actually bad for the state. <laughs> so then there's another kind, and by the way, I'm not discussing in the order he discusses them, in, but there's another kind that he calls religion of the priest. So, um... Um, this is what actually happened to Christianity, according to Rousseau. 
So in other words, this was the religion Jesus was actually preaching. But this is what actually happened when Christianity became a real religion. And what is it? Well, so um, as he puts it, when he discusses what Jesus did, so this is back on page 244, the last paragraph on page 244. In separating the theological, oops, you can't see that. In separating the theological system from the political system, this made the states cease being united and caused internal divisions that have never ceased to agitate Christian peoples. Right? What he's saying is that, um, so what Jesus meant was, my kingdom is not a kingdom of this world, meaning like, um, to be a member of my kingdom is to be a member of what Kant calls the kingdom of ends. That is, it's to be a moral person. Um, it's, therefore, it has no political structure. It has no rulers. It's everyone on their own doing what they, what they ought to do. That's the kingdom. That's the spiritual kingdom. Um, but, um, but very quickly, Rousseau thinks... And this is the same development that Hobbes talks about and, and deplores. Um, priests figured out how to make that spiritual kingdom into a real kingdom. And as soon as that happens, now you have two kingdoms, right? As Hobbes put it, you know, it's like uh, there's two kingdoms, one inhabited by human beings and the other inhabited by fairies, both coexisting in the same population. Um, so, um, um, right, Rousseau says this is what the pagans suspected the Christians were up to. They thought the Christians, you know, the Christians said, oh no, we're not competing with your secular authority. We just have this spiritual kingdom. And the pagans looked at them and said, oh, they're saying that now, but they just want to take over. Um, and sure enough, it was true. That's why they did take over. Right, uh, and when they took over, they uh, outlawed paganism. <laughs> right, so at least eventually. Um, but, um, um, but I mean, but I guess where the pagans were wrong was that what wasn't ex just hypocritical was the idea that political power and religious power are separate. So even once the Christians took over, they still never managed to have a unified state. There was always a conflict between the supreme political power, like the emperor, and the supreme religious power, like the pope. Um, so, um, so Rousseau's main example, like his paradigm example of the religion of the priest, is Roman Catholicism. But um, he offers a bunch of other examples. Right, he says eventually that, you know, like that Muhammad, you know, saw that this would be a bad thing and tried to head it off, but no, eventually things like this happened in Islam as well. Um, uh, he mentions especially Shia Islam where, you know, there was, there was more of this kind of conflict. Um, but, uh, you know, and he says that Japan has the same situation. Uh, I don't know how accurate that is, but I guess, I mean, the, the emperor was the, I guess the head of the, you know, the, no, I don't know, actually. I'm, I'm not sure. But, um, but what he doesn't say, but what he's clearly thinking is that Protestantism hasn't solved this problem at all. Right, that as we saw in the English Civil War and Scotland and in Geneva and in France and everywhere, you know, or Holland, I guess in France the Protestants were suppressed, but like in Holland, um, that sure enough we have this continued conflict between the secular authorities and the religious authorities. However, the church is constituted, it considers itself to be a higher authority than the state. Even in England, where the king, you know, literally becomes the head of the Anglican Church, it doesn't prevent this conflict. It still keeps breaking out. Um, 
So, uh, so therefore, Rousseau says, basically for the same reason Hobbes does, that, you know, this is bad for the state, and this is at least as, well, I don't know, maybe not quite as bad, but it's, yeah, it's not quite as bad, but it's still bad, right? So he says, like, take the Crusades, you know, there's an example of, quote, unquote, Christians fighting bravely. But he says that's because they were really not soldiers of um, the spiritual kingdom, which there couldn't be. They were really soldiers of the Pope, of a real kingdom, <laughs> right? So, I mean, so which from his point of view is better, <laughs> right? Like, at least this religion of the priest can somewhat get itself together to do stuff. But the problem is that it keeps getting involved in fights with itself. So it's still not a good thing. So, um, what would be a good thing? Well, so apparently, like I said, there may be a fourth one that's better than this. Oh, I'm not even sure I'm going to get have time to finish talking about this, let alone get to anything else. But, all right, so uh, let me just say briefly what the religion of the citizen is. And the example of the religion of the citizen is supposed to be Old Testament religion as Rousseau reconstructs it. In fact, that's probably the, 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 the only really clear example that he knows of because what the religion of the citizen is supposed to be is the idea that um, our commonwealth is really ruled by a god. One God, because it's only one commonwealth. Our commonwealth is ruled by one God. Other commonwealths are ruled by other gods, <laughs> right? So it's, um, uh, there's a term for this, which I'm now forgetting. But anyway, it's a form of polytheism where you believe that there are many gods, but you only worship one of them. And a lot of people have felt that the Old Testament, at least the older layers of it, so to speak, really represent something like that rather than true monotheism. Now, I don't know about the interpretive question about the Bible. That's, well, it's not worth getting into in this course anyway. It's irrelevant. But, um, but Rousseau, anyway, is not alone in thinking that, you know, if you read certain biblical texts, it looks like they're acknowledging the authority of other gods over other people. Um, so, um, um, so if you reconstruct it that way, then it would be a good example of this. Now, so why is it that, that most of the ancient polytheists worshipped more than one god? Right. They didn't, you know, like the Greeks, like in Athens. Yeah, they had their god, their goddess, Athena, but they, you know, they had a lot of other gods and goddesses, too. So I think Rousseau has to explain this as a result of layers of conquest or something like that. It's not very good. Um, but in any case, since I'm almost out of time, <laughs> I'll just say. So this religion of the citizen is supposed to be good because, you know, um, so like um, when the soldiers are fighting, they're fighting for the state and they're counting on the God of the state, the God of the commonwealth to be on their side. Um, and they hope the God of their commonwealth can defeat the God of the other commonwealth that they're fighting against. So they're not thinking at all of like how, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if they lose because their God will reward them. No, if they lose, that will mean their God got defeated. <laughs> right? It's terrible. So, um, so Rousseau says, you know, this is a way that religion can work in concert with a commonwealth, with a civil state to make it stronger rather than weaker. And it's clearly this kind of religion that the legislator used. Remember, I was talking about it last week. Again, I'm not going to have time to go into it. But that the legislator used to institute, to, to get the people to, to pass these wise set of laws to begin with. You know, um, the legislator said, 
hey, I've talked to our God, and our God says, these are the laws that I want you to accept. And an example would be Moses. He's also thinking of something, certain things in the history of Rome, etc. but the example would be Moses, right? Goes up the mountain and comes back and says, okay, here's what God says. Do these things and you can be my people. <laughs> um, and the only problem with this, and the only reason that maybe he introduces a fourth one that we won't be able to talk about, but it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a compromise between these two. It's like a civil religion, but without special rites and ceremonies. Simple civil religion. Um, but, um, but in any case, the only problem with this one is, he says, yeah, it's a little bit of a problem because it's based on lies and deception. <laughs> that's, that's kind of a problem. Um, all right, there's more to say about that, but I'm out of time, so uh, and next week is Wollstonecraft, so I guess I'll just have to leave that hanging. Okay, see you then. Bye.